Um, glad to be here. It's been uh, a year uh, away, and during that time, I'm glad to see that Patrick Henry is doing well. Uh, students are coming, uh, the snow has stopped falling, and we're here to talk about, well, not just serving on the highest levels, as many Patrick Henry students do, but in some ways serving on the lowest levels, uh, among people who are poor and needy, and how can we help them, and how can we help them help themselves? How can we help them to understand a little bit about being made in God's image, and therefore capable of doing great things, even if they've been told for a long time that they're incapable, that they just have to sit and take what people give them and can't do anything themselves. Uh, James Whitford is our guest today, and he has been serving at the highest level of the lowest level uh, for many years now. Uh, he received a doctorate from the University of Kansas School of Medicine, emphasizing physical therapy and administration of rehab programs, then he moved on from rehabbing, rehabbing bodies to rehabbing lives. In 2000, James and his wife Marsha opened a small outreach in Joplin, Missouri, calling it Watered Gardens Gospel Rescue Mission. Uh, James and Marsha have also co-authored five children. Uh, he continues to direct Watered Gardens, which operates without any government funding. It's volunteer, it's community-based. Uh, he's now founded the True Charity Initiative, and is hoping to use what he's learned in Joplin to jumpstart programs around the country. And he's already helped to start several of them. He made it here yesterday, despite the snowstorm. So please join me in welcoming James Whitford. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, first question, Watered Gardens. Why that <laughs> right. name? Watered Gardens. Uh, we are, uh, we're not a lawn and garden care center, I'll oh. tell you that. That's... Oh. Uh, we've gotten coals before like that. Do you sell bird baths down there? No, no, we don't. Okay. But uh, it, it comes out of the Bible, and it's in, uh, 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 in the book of Isaiah, chapter 58. God is actually chastising his people. Uh, in in uh, The short version would be for just going to church, and that's all and not doing any more. And he goes on to say, is this not the fast that I've chosen for you to feed the hungry, to shelter the poor, to clothe the naked, uh, to welcome the poor into your house, and then you'll be like a watered garden and like a spring whose waters never fail. So the name of our ministry is really dealing with a blessing that is promised to God's people when they're busy doing what God wants them to do in helping people who are struggling. And uh, so that's always been our heartbeat from the very beginning, Dr. Lasky, is to see the church at work uh, ministering to people who are in need. Believing that the church is the carrier of the gospel of Christ really does have the answer for man's plight today. So you're deeply rooted now in Joplin. Tell us a little bit about, about the city. Well, the city is, uh, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's right there in, a, in the four-state corner of Arkansas, Oklahoma, Kansas, and of course Missouri, uh, and right on the I-44 junction. So it's a population of about 50,000, but uh, during the day that'll swell to you know 150,000 or more people that come into the city. And so uh, it, it's a bustling, it's a bustling community, and uh, and and we have our our issues like any other city dealing with poverty and homelessness. But uh, there's a there's a large section. Uh, probably a little less than a third that would uh, would 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 qualify from uh, from the strict definition of poverty as being poor. And when my wife and I visited there several years ago, we saw the the path of the tornado, which which roared right through Joplin and uh, took out lots of homes. Um, how did that affect your work when when that when that uh, disaster happened? Well. Uh, we we basically, as a ministry, said, "What do we do really well that um, you know is not being done in some other areas?" and and tried to maximize our impact in that regard. Um, you know, there was there was so much affected at that time when when that happened in the city and things changed. What was really amazing about that time is to see the spontaneous volunteer effort that happened with neighbors and family members and everybody just coming together in a time of, of need like that. And, um, uh, you know, it, it reminds me of uh, Edward Devine, um, Charity Organization Society General Secretary, like 1897, mm -hmm. said that we, we really do tend to think a little too much of the systems that we've created for charity and that if none of those systems for relief were there, 
probably most, if not all, the need would be met through spontaneous volunteer effort of neighbors and local community. And uh, we saw that. That was one of the, you know, I guess the silver lining to the cloud was to see so much compassion poured out uh, immediately from, from that local area. And some people were used to doing that in many ways, even apart from the disaster, because there are lots of disasters that, uh, that affect, affect lives. So how did, right. how did you start training people in the community to think in these terms? Well, really, one of the first things we did is uh, just realizing, you know, we, got, we started this small little ministry 18 years ago out of a heart of compassion, but not a lot of thought behind it. It really was just a compassionate work, and uh, we didn't have quite the mind for the poor. We certainly had a heart for the poor. But we realized early on that uh, we're meeting a lot of needs, giving away a lot of things, helping a lot of people, but then where are they going after that in our community? And so we, we thought, we've got to figure out a way to begin to connect organizations and churches and like-minded missions together in a community so that we can make sure we're doing a better job of stewarding our resources effectively, but also targeting our charity more accurately to really make sure we're helping people. So we that was one of the things that we did. It wasn't really educational as much as it was a tool, but connecting all of these churches and organizations online real time to share that information about families and individuals being helped was enormously helpful. Uh, and especially when the tornado came, we already had about 30 organizations connected online talking. So we were already very united in a collaborative effort. And then, of course, after that, that, that grew about another 30 organizations that came on board. And so uh, it's been very helpful. There's a whole other educational aspect to the idea of of effective charity, that we do lunch and learns and events and things like that and bring leaders together in that area to talk about rethinking charity, that it's got to be more than just guttural compassionate work, that there really has to be some thought behind what we do if we're going to effectively help people out of poverty. Well, tell us about that. Uh, uh, how do you start getting people thinking, uh, not just, well, I'm going to do this because it makes me feel warm, to give some money to someone or help in that way. How do you get people thinking in terms of what the effect actually is on the poor as opposed to what the effect is on the giver? Yeah, so people who are already giving, they're tending to feel it anyway, but sometimes can't identify it. It's like, I've been helping this person a lot and I don't know that things are getting better and I'm not feeling so good about it. But they may not be able to uh, couple that with some of the things that we would teach about uh, the, the, oh, the benefit of work in a person's life, the importance of entering into exchange with people who are in need and making sure they're not just, it's not a one-way transaction where the they're the recipient of our benevolence and that alone. Uh, we, we teach these five steps to dependency that Robert Lupton wrote in his book, Toxic Charity, that if, a, if you give something to somebody once, they'll have an appreciation for it. If you give it to them again, they'll have an anticipation that you'll do it a third time. If you give it a third time, they'll have an expectation that you'll do it a fourth. If you give it a fourth time, they're going to feel entitled to it, whatever it is. And a fifth time, they'll be dependent on you for it. Well, those things make a lot of sense. And I think people that uh, are wrestling with some of the, uh, the, uh, the downside of charity that may not have a lot of thought behind it, when they hear those and they're educated along those lines, some lights begin to come on and they'll change the way they're practicing. Well, what's wrong with feeling entitled to it? After all, this is a, this is a big country and in God's kindness, it's a rich country. Um, why shouldn't we just uh, give without asking any questions and, and uh, uh, let other people uh, enjoy without necessarily having to work the, the bounty that we have? Well, I don't think that it's God's design for us as people to simply be on the, on the receiving end of, uh, of someone else's benevolence. Uh, so when we talk about, if we can just look at the city or the community and all of the people in it, how, how are they interacting together? That's an important question to ask. We have social structures and you know, educational institutions and uh, you know, yeah, and then all of the people that are bustling around in a city and asking how they interact is really, really important. When we talk about solidarity, what's, what's solidarity in your community? Well, the definition of solidarity is the degree of integration between people groups. And I like to key in on that word integration because its root word is integer, like one single whole unit, right? When I begin to think about that and 
people within a city that should be in solidarity. I can uh, make analogous comparisons to the human body, which is my background, and so um, the study of the body. And I think, well, that's a great example of a single whole unit, the human person, and inside are systems and a lot of living units inside. And there are two things that are absolutely for sure in the living body that is obviously in solidarity. Every living unit, every cell, both receives and consumes, right? Mm -hmm. But also produces. Every cell has a, has a function. It, 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 it has a purpose. If, if you have a section of your body that is not producing, you're sick. If you have a section of your city that's not involved in producing, the city is ill also. So we can't just shrug our shoulders and say, well, people are poor, we should just give to them and give to them and give to them, because that would be really a sign of illness in a community. We have to enter into uh, exchange with people who are in need one way or another, and uh, that's going to make for a healthier city. So it sounds like you're suggesting that just giving is not really a kind thing to do. <laughs> I mean, uh, tell us about yeah. how, how you get, how do you move people from the sense of, of thinking this is, this, is, this is kindness to give and to ask, right. to ask anyone to track whether the person actually makes use of it, to find out what happens to that person down the line. In some way you are invading that person's privacy and dignity. How do you, how do you change thinking along those well, lines? Well, I, I think it's really important to understand the purpose of compassion. Compassion is a guttural emotion. In fact, in the, in the Bible, the Greek is splenic zomai. It means from the gut or from the, from the viscera. Mm -hmm. And so this is a, uh, uh, and it's an emotion that's elicited when we're around, around someone who's, what's the purpose of that? I believe every person being created in the image of a compassionate God has the capacity to feel compassion, regardless of faith or not. But when you feel it, what is it you're going to do with it? What's the purpose of it? Well, I, 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 I argue that the purpose is, is justice. Now, now, I like Ken Weitzman's definition of justice in his book, Pursuing Justice. He says, truth pertains to what is, justice pertains to what ought to be. And I have met uh, so many people over the years that have shared their life story with me. In fact, I'll just take a moment and share sure. one story with you. Her name's Heidi. Heidi was sitting in my, in my office and just sharing her, her life with me. Three siblings. She was one of three siblings. She was the oldest uh, in, a, in a, an unhealthy household. Uh, her mother was a, a, a drug user. Dad was abusive. Her mom told the girls, I'm going to take you away in the night, and uh, we're not going to tell your dad. We're just going to leave. The girls were excited about this. And it ended up that mom did leave, but left the girls. And then her well, father, why? her father became, we don't, I don't know why. Okay. Her father became more abusive. Uh, at one point, beat her on the back with a belt. The, the, she was looking at the welts that had been left on her back. Her dad noticed what he had done, felt guilty, but in his own sickness, didn't know how to handle that, pulled her into the kitchen and said, I want you to put my hand on the flame of the stove as a payback for what I've done to you. Mm -hmm. She couldn't do it. She was 13 years old, soon after ran away, became a pain drug addict, had a couple of kids later on, right? She's still a young woman, mm -hmm. had a couple of kids, didn't know how to parent well, can you imagine why? Gave them a Xanax. The kids were taken by DFS. She continued to cycle out. She ends up homeless on the streets and in my office weeping about that. Now. You look at that life and it's easy to say that is not what was intended to be. It's not that there's an injustice where we can point a finger and say it's that person's fault or this person's fault. She would even point the finger at herself and say it's much my fault. But the point is, is that things for Heidi did not end up as they were intended or as they should have been. So there is some injustice somewhere. Our compassion somehow has to bring justice about. It has to begin to right those kinds of wrongs to restore things that should be there in the first place. Well, our charity is the outflow of the compassion. It's the bridge piece. It's like you have compassion as a fuel, charity as a vehicle, and justice as a destination. Mm -hmm. But if your charity is ineffective, you'll never get there. If I never sat down to ask Heidi all these questions and get to know her, I'm not going to know how to best deliver charity where it's going to help 
Heidi. Similarly, uh, anybody who says, well, I just I feel compassion. I want to give. I want to give. I want to give. That kind of charity is ineffective. It'll never lead to restoring things correctly that, that should be. So when we had lunch just a while ago, I was telling you about uh, just my recent experience in, in Dublin, mm -hmm. talking with a, a person who uh, very much cares for the poor, uh, has been leading a program, a feeding program for 49 years, but he would say, as, as I mentioned, he would, he would say, no, you are, you are invading Heidi's privacy to actually start delving into her past and so forth. Uh, why do that? First of all, tell us what happened with Heidi. And then secondly, what do you say about this question of invasion of privacy and trying to move a person in a particular direction uh, uh, where the person may not necessarily want to go because the person's not having that mindset? Tell us about Heidi and then, and then well, generalize from <laughs> sure. there. I can, I can tell you the outcomes of many stories, and I'm trying to remember where, where Heidi went. The last time I remember seeing Heidi, she had a, a sonic outfit on, so she was employed and okay. uh, was uh, not, not living at the shelter, so she had a place to live. And so I think things had gotten better for, for her. And, uh, you know, again, that was probably just from some of the work going on at the mission. What was your other question? Well, Dr. To tell, tell us then... Um, in Heidi's case, or yeah, in the case of other people sure. you've, you've mentioned, uh, um, you seem to want to do something more than just feed. You right. actually want to want to help to change that person's life, and perhaps be God's instrument in doing that. But what gives you? Um, I'm, I'm voicing what I think uh, the the uh, uh, the friar in Dublin would say. Right. I mean, what gives you the standing to yeah. be trying to influence her in that way, rather than just letting her go in whatever direction she wants? There are probably many different answers for this, but I think the one that comes to mind is that we are, as Christians, to be a part of the entire redemptive process that is at work right now. So we know from, we read in the book of Romans, chapter 8, I think, there's a groaning in the earth, and, and uh, things are not as they should be, but there's a process underway of redemption that will become complete. And uh, as, as, as carriers of, of the kingdom here on earth that is quite astray from where it ought to be, we have a role to play in the whole redemptive process. And if I can help Heidi or others, you know, be redeemed from the position that they're, they're in or the, the struggles that they're in, I have a responsibility to that end, and it plays into the whole redemption of creation. Uh, and, and so how can I just feed or just clothe without digging deeper, uh, spending more time, investing more of my own life to try to really help someone who's in need. And, and I hear you saying that uh, we understand enough about human nature from reading the Bible uh, that, in fact, we are going to be um, happier being productive than, than just taking. Uh, so I guess I'm asking, right. um, this seems to be going so much against the contemporary spirit of, of giving. That is, give without asking any questions, right. uh, give without looking for any outcome, uh, exercise, uh, do, do random, random acts. Uh, you're obviously not doing random acts. You have a certain plan. Uh, you, be, you believe there is, a, there is a way that the lives of these individuals who come can be improved. So your goal is not to keep them in poverty, but, help, but challenge them to come out of poverty. Yes. Uh, what yeah. kind of, how do you educate a community to think in those terms when, in fact, so much of the teaching we get goes counter to that? Well, there's a number of things that we, can, uh, that, that we, we talk about and share with people. Um, in, in the Journal of Applied Psychology, 2015, a study of more than 6,000 adults unemployed for more than four years but sustained by the state in another country, okay? No yeah. work, but they've got everything that they need. Uh, and they measure five key psychometric measures, and there were three of them, agreeableness and openness and conscientiousness, that they all dropped significantly compared to a control group. And, and so they're pointing to grumpiness, right, as a result of people that are just not working. And so we can give you everything that you need, but it's not what uh, makes a person flourish. It's not having all of the basics. Uh, part of flourishing comes in production and work. And uh, 
uh, if, if you were to close your eyes or if I asked anybody and just said, what, what, do, you, what do you see when you think of a, a homeless, poor person? Most often it's someone who's still. They're not at work uh, in, in some productive way of labor. And, and uh, so that is so, that's so important. In fact, at our mission, we have a worth shop. We call it a worth shop because we believe that work awakens worth in people's lives. So folks are coming in and, and they'll earn, you know, we'll meet more than 20,000 basic needs in a year and people are earning those things by crafting goods that go to market or working in our redeemed bean coffee business. But rather than just thinking of work as a, as a good outcome, which it is, we should be looking at long-term employment as an outcome, let's start it on the front end especially if it's going to help a person feel better about who they are. Let's start with work on the front end of charity and then see what our outcomes are after that. So you're defining poverty as not, as not just a material question. It's a poverty of spirit, essentially. It, it, it is, exactly. So anytime that... Uh, when, when, when I walked outside of our mission doors one evening and there were three men who were residents at our shelter and uh, one of them stopped me and said, hey, I, I've just got to tell you, I've been to a lot of different missions, but I've never been to one where I had to work for my bed and meals. You guys take the shame out of the game. And the guy standing beside him said, yeah, it's like we get to keep our dignity. I, I have met so many people that have had comments like that because of, their, of the partnership that we enter into with them at our mission, that I would look at them and, and if I were to say, do you feel poor? I would, I would bet they would say no. Okay. The, uh, uh, you, you tell some stories in uh, uh, the literature from, from uh, uh, Water Gardens about how uh, a single mom receiving welfare benefits uh, is less likely to become involved in the community, uh, to, to show up at a, uh, at a church's dress for interview clothing ministry. Uh, so, and, and you, you, you go on this way, uh, an elderly person um, who has a cupboard full of government subsidized food, you're less likely to volunteer preparing him a meal. So every time this is done, certain, certain things are given by professionals, the person suffers in a way, right. the, the beneficiary suffers, other potential volunteers suffer, mm -hmm. uh, but it's, it's still harder to do. I mean, have you found in Joplin um, that people who are, who are working, sometimes who have uh, uh, jobs that really tire them out, how do you get them to do more, to come out in the evening or to come out on weekends rather than, rather than staying home and just... Uh, um, uh, lying around essentially how do you how do you this this well, is this is clearly what we need to <laughs> sure. do is is to is to have more volunteers more right. people coming forward but it's very difficult to do in the society tell us in Joplin how you've been able to move people well I'd like to say that we've been really really successful at that but I mean it, it is a struggle uh, and, I, and I'm thinking of just the need for uh, fraternal type association in a community and how important that is. And we're, we're always wanting to point people to church groups or other small groups where they can be connected and have social, ca social, social capital. But I'm, I'm thinking of what uh, Alexis de Tocqueville wrote in, in Democracy in America, and he was saying that the more that the state uh, supplants, is the word he uses, the more the state supplants these fraternal social connections in a community and, a, and, and gives aid to the individual, the, the less of those associations we're going to see. And then when the individual finds him or herself in need, they'll turn back to the state again for help. And that really, he was describing a crowd out effect. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that we're seeing throughout our nation today. Uh, we have such a, a paternal large, overreaching government that's helping the individual in our community that we have volunteers that are staying at home at night because they don't feel as needed. And we have the individual who could really benefit from bonding and relationship with those people. And they're just turning to the government for help. It really is exactly as Tocqueville said, it's happening in our midst right now. I wish I could say we were incredibly successful. Uh, I think that we have certainly helped a great number of people in our community understand that real relationship development is key and it's going to have to happen. Uh, but how many people really want that? Because Dr. Olasky, in real relationship, there's accountability. Oh, yeah. There's, and, and that means effort. 
And, and so here we've got a mission who wants to involve people in work. We've got volunteers that are thinking about relationships where, where there's accountability. And all this sounds like work, and, and it is. And human nature is to take the easiest way out. And as long as we have a, an overreaching state that's involving itself without being able to really know people, like know Heidi, like I know Heidi, then they'll always make mistakes in how they're delivering service and care. Okay, so... All of these programs that are designed to um, let uh, affluent people not have to be involved, let poor people uh, be able to receive things, I hear you saying that that actually is, is, uh, um, is, is causing less happiness, yes, basically. Yes, absolutely. Uh, because it, because you, you'll often hear people who, um, who have uh, jobs but in many ways, the most rewarding thing in their lives is often when they do volunteer work and help a person in need. And basically, they're, they're being told that they're not needed because some professional will come and do it. And the professionals are usually miserable in the situation because <laughs> they, they have so many people to deal with that they turn into numbers rather than real human beings. And their hands are often tied by yeah. regulation as well. Yeah. So when you, when you explain this to people in Joplin, again, your experience there, um, do light bulbs, uh, if we're doing a, a cartoon, do the light bulbs appear? Do people say, oh yeah? Or do people say, again, I gave it the office, I pay my taxes, I just don't need to be involved? No, light bulbs certainly, yeah, come on. And, and uh, it's one of the reasons why over the years we've been able to grow a mission that uh, will host more than 700 volunteer shifts every month. So we have, we're primarily a volunteer-driven organization, and, and so we have a lot of people that are very active, and we're educating them as they come through our doors, thinking they're going to come in and, and fold some clothes or sort some inventory or whatever, but uh, we really want people to know it's all about the folks who are, they're going to meet and building relationships with them. Um, so uh, we're, we're continuously you know, hammering away at that and the importance of it. But again, um, when you have um, right now the, the, the latest welfare, right? Our government subsidized smart cell phones. So now it's not just a, a flip phone of some sort, it's actually smart cell phone with data. So you get free data on the phone. So now we're, we're battling pe you know, po people who are unhappy and oppressed, and, and, but they're sunk into this form of entertainment that's been handed to them that they haven't had to work for. And again, when the tug for relationship comes on there, hey, right, I'm, I'm so placated by things that are being given to me that I'm not sure I really am that interested in developing a real relationship with someone else. So, so what are the key parts then of the True Charity Initiative? Well, uh, connection within a community. Uh, we want to make sure we're connecting community well together, and education is big. So pervasively educating community through PSAs. and uh, It can't just be the leaders of not-for-profits and churches. It, it really needs to be the entire community that understands. So we do a lot of different PSAs where we're coupling compassion and common sense for radio listeners and TV viewers in our region to begin to rethink charity. Uh, that's, that's a big part of it. Lastly, though, uh, my hope is that we can see communities form up in that way where they're rethinking charity, practicing in a different way, connected well together, and that that might set the stage for some policy change. Because I really believe we're going to have to see policy that respects and protects subsidiarity, where it should be neighbor helping neighbor first, local church and organization helping neighbor before state and federal government. And until we have policy that protects that principle of subsidiarity, I think we're a nation that's sinking. Now $21 trillion in debt and people are, the, the, the divide between the have and the have nots is widening. And it's not because, um, uh, it's not because we're, uh, well, it's, it's it, well, let me tell you why it is. Yeah. It's because there are, uh, there are so many, handouts that are happening right now and the welfare system is so robust right now uh, that there's not a need for the relationship development that's got to happen. So there is a divide that's happening more and more so. 
Um, so the, the, the True Charity Initiative is a hope of seeing communities get better about it and then hopefully leverage some of that for some policy change that would make sense where people aren't able to just go down to the welfare office and say, I want to sign up for a SNAP card that I can go buy whatever I want at whatever store. Mm -hmm. But maybe first, I'm going to go to the local food pantry that's going to engage me in a way where they really care. So people who defend the current welfare system say, well, it's all very well to hear these talks about what individuals could do, but we haven't really seen it yet, and so we can't cut back <laughs> on welfare until we see it. Right. But you're saying, until we cut back on welfare, we really won't see it. So how yeah. do you get through that uh, bind? Well, it, you, 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 you take the case studies and the stories and some of the other research, like some of what I've been mentioning to you, and you try to couple that together as, uh, as, your, as your substance for the argument. But you're going to see more of it when you see the policy change happen. And we've seen that even in just some simple welfare reform things where back to work welfare reform and, and people go, when they did it in Missouri just a, a year and a half ago, uh, there were articles that people might starve to death. Well, I didn't say that, but I mean, that, sure. was, the, that was the general sentiment. Not at all. Everything's been just fine, and in fact, more people have gone back to work. And so uh, sometimes we've got to do some reform to see the fruit. Okay, I have one more question, then I'm going to turn to folks here in the audience who want to ask questions. Um, what difference do you think Watered Gardens has really made in Joplin? If Watered Gardens did, did not yeah. exist, if you hadn't started it back almost two decades ago, in what ways would Joplin be different? I... I it reminds me of the movie, It's a Wonderful Life. Uh -huh. I'd like to think that's kind of how things are. You don't know until you could see the whole picture without you uh, or your ministry there. Um, and so I, I could never even begin to guess. But I can say that I'm sure that there would be more people who are homeless and camping on the streets than there are right now. So that's one of the things. And, and I also think that um, um, if you were to go into Joplin and you said, what do you think about... What do you think about uh, handouts? Or have you ever heard of the five steps to dependency? Most people have heard something along those lines, whether it's been through our PSAs or educational events. So I think we've turned the tide in thinking about how to do charity work. Uh, the next step really does need to be seeing if we can nudge the state back and let the local community do more, begin to pick more of that ball up. And what prospects are of that happening? Well, since I'm here uh, with you on this show right now, <laughs> I'm, I'm hopeful that there'll be some listeners out there that have, uh, have some power in their pen that might consider some things like that. It, it seems pretty bleak. So, Dr. Olasky, whenever I speak with federal-level uh, legislators, it's kind of a blank stare. When I speak with state legislators, they get it, and they'd be more than happy to try a pilot program, but their hands are often tied because these welfare uh, components are, are federally funded with strings uh -huh. attached, so they don't have as much control as they'd like. Uh, but boy, if we could have it turned over to where the states had control of how welfare was being done in their own state, I believe we'd see communities that would be able to trial a charity zone, is what I call it. Okay. Questions for any of you? Yes, ma'am. One of the questions for one of We'll have to get a microphone to you. One of the criticisms that you often hear is um, that God's grace is free, and so why, who are you to put conditions on charity? How do you respond to something like that? Well, I, I would say charity, unfortunately, is a word that's been relegated to a handout, and it's kind of implied even in the question, which is a, would be a common kind of question. But I think I would want to ask that person, what, what, is, what is charity? Uh, and, 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 and then consider that in the Bible it's exchanged with the word love. And so we, we think of charity as some sort of a handout, but truth be told, charity is love in action. And it's the, it is the outflow of compassion, and it can either be effective or ineffective. So now the ball would go back in the court of the person asking the question, which is, what, 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 shall, what charity shall you exercise? So shall you just give things away, or would you do something else that might be more effective in leading to really righting some of the wrong that's going on in a person's life? Just ask, the, uh, you mentioned the National Alliance to End Homelessness. You say, has it wrong? 
uh, it leads us to believe that a house is the answer. So isn't a house the answer to homelessness? Isn't that <laughs> A house is not the answer to homelessness. In fact, a colleague once said, uh, a person doesn't become homeless when he runs out of money. He becomes homeless when he runs out of friends. And it's kind of interesting to consider that uh, our relationships in community are, are incredibly important. And a house does not solve the problem of homelessness. Um, and, and so uh, there's always, in my experience over 18 years, is that uh, chronic pro- poverty and homelessness is almost always rooted in broken relationship of some sort. Broken relationship between man and his family, between man and his community, or between man and his God. But there's always broken relationship involved. And uh, so if that's the case, why would we think a house is going to solve the problem? Okay. Question. Plus. Uh, you mentioned uh, that, um, uh, there, that, that cell phones have had a, a kind of a disincentivizing kind of effect on people and, and makes them less likely to be engaged. Uh, have you noticed any other changes in kind of the, the culture of poverty that, with the people that you're dealing with in the last five or ten years? I mean, aside from the cell phones, what other kinds of changes have you seen in that culture? A well, uh, younger uh, population in the mission, so that's one thing. Um, we're seeing more and more people that are uh, applying for early SSI disability. So those, those stats are you know, nationwide have gone up 200% in the last 10 or 15 years, and we're seeing a lot of that in the mission. And the other thing that I'm seeing more and more of uh, are people being, um, they're recommend, they're being recommended by other organizations or state-funded agencies that are in our community to be homeless so they'll qualify for HUD's rapid rehousing program. That's another thing that I've seen in the last few years since HUD has really ramped up what they call housing first, the idea of just put people in a house and we'll start from there. And rather than, you know, build relationship first and then move from there. And uh, as a result, we're seeing people that I, I sat down with a young man. He was a young guy, too. And he's staying at our mission. I didn't know that. His name was Seth. Sat down with a table at Seth, had a meal with him, was asking his story. He said, I'm, I was living with my mom and my grandmother. Things weren't going so well, and he told me that an agency had said that if he would come and live at the mission, he'd probably qualify for his own, his own house. That's why he was staying at our mission. And so uh, we're seeing more and more of that kind of thing happening. It's, uh, it's a strange web of incentive that's at work that really comes from, a, from the federal level. And it, and it hurts people. It's very sad and divides family. Even in our situation in Joplin with the tornado, we had, I think it was five or six weeks before FEMA trailers landed in our community. We had 7,000 plus people that were rendered homeless immediately. There there weren't that many shelters, so that means they were with family and friends. But when the FEMA trailers come, there was no longer a need for family or friends to help their family or friends. So we've got to be thinking about all of that stuff. And when, when we have federal uh, help coming into a particular community, what does it do to that community? What does it do to the individual and their relationships that they've formed? So there seems to be a basic dispute about dignity. In other words, people would say, well, uh, these folks are now homeless because of the tornado. They're having to ask family and friends to stay with them. They're probably crowding in. This cuts into their dignity as opposed to having their own FEMA trailer, which then enables them to be independent, gives them dignity, does not make them have to enter into discussions with people maybe with whom they don't get along. So uh, there's there's a whole (laughs) movement. There's there's a a, a dispute here about what dignity is. Sure. Well, I I, I coupled dignity with... In this, in this regard, well, there's an inherent dignity as creations of God, but then dignity and independence are something to be considered. So let, let us not be confused. Moving into a government-funded trailer is not independence. Okay. Neither is, is, is it independent to live with your family member. But if you're going to take one or the other, you should take the, the latter. You should take living with your family member because you're, you're not independent when, when you're living in a, in a government-funded trailer either. So there's no dignity in that. Okay. Yes. 
Um, Mr. Whitford, thank you so much for being here. Um, my question is, Christians are often stereotyped in our culture as being opposed to social justice and charity um, because they've often advocated for like private charity instead. So how, do, how can Christians demonstrate um, that we do care about social justice concerns and charity um, even if we do disagree with the broader culture about solutions? Oh, I almost want you to restate the question. So uh, well, why, why don't you reread it for me? Sure. Yeah. So Okay, so Christians um, are often stereotyped as being sort of backward when it comes to social justice, okay. or like we don't really care about charity because right. we maybe are, sometimes are against government handouts or just different solutions. Oh, I see. So how can Christians demonstrate that we do care and we do have solutions or ideas that will help, uh -huh. um, even if they're not the same that other people believe? Yeah, well, you got to do your homework. I mean, really, right? We got to dig in. I think we need to be students. Uh, of, of, of what's going on. Be good investigators. Um, what's really working? I mean, um, is, is, this, is the social justice movement, what is that? And what, you know, I mean, let's ask some really hard questions about social justice and what that means. And, uh, and, and, and then look at the outcome. We should always be looking at outcomes, right? So I think it's one of our principles of true charity. A true charity is measuring things that matter. So are, are we looking at outcomes and, and what's going on with uh, some of the social justice movement? And um, so I think we've got to be students, and then we've got to be voices. So you've got to be able to, to articulate some of those, the things that you're finding. And, um, and probably you also need to be really involved. So I have a whole bunch of stories <laughs> where I have actually seen the problems of these things. It makes it really easy for me to say, oh, no, let me tell you about so-and-so. Because I, I, I know of how things that seem good on the outside that might seem like they're helpful are actually more hurtful and harmful to the individual. And if we're involving ourselves at ground level with people who are broken and hurting and in need, we'll also find some of those uh, truths for our own sake that we can then share with other people. So Great Britain now has a, a minister of loneliness. Basically, <laughs> they've set up a, a cabinet level position. Uh, and I mean, it sounds, it sounds like uh, we in this country are, through our taxes, through the welfare system, are actually facilitating loneliness. Uh, do we do, how, how do we, how do we start moving away from that? Or, I, I take it you're not asking for a secretary of loneliness here in this country. <laughs> but in a way, you are, you are an yeah. opponent of loneliness. You're trying to have people depend on each other rather than in a lonely way depend on the government. Uh, but it's, it's, it counters so much of the education kids get in school yeah. about poverty fighting. So yeah. tell, me, tell me in Joplin, uh, yeah. I think the nationwide statistics, uh, you allude to this in one place, that volunteering, volunteering is down 4% nationwide over the past decade. Right. What's happened in Joplin? What, well, what have you been able to find out at that level so that we can apply generally? I, I think what we ought to do is look for opportunities whenever there's a cut being made that where the government's involved. Let's see if we can't round up some volunteers to help. And right. I'm thinking of our program, we call it Neighbor Connect. So Neighbor Connect connects one neighbor's need to another neighbor's skill. So we've been doing that for years. Uh, it's, a great, it's a great little program. And uh, we just database what people are able to do, and it categorizes them by their skill. And then we're vetting needs, and then we're c coupling up neighbors like that. And uh, uh, so, so you know, we've just got to watch for opportunities. The one I'm thinking about was, uh, it'll come to me, it's the Meals on Wheels. Mm -hmm. So Meals on Wheels, we've got, got some cuts. Do you remember this? It was in the news. Oh my gosh, people are going to starve. Meals on Wheels are going to cut Meals on Wheels funding, right? And I immediately thought, I'm going to get my neighbor connect director and have a conversation with her and say, hey, why don't we pick up doing some Meals on Wheels? And so now we do. So we've begun a weekend of Meals on Wheels to work, you know, adjunctively alongside the current Meals on Wheels program. Why not? I mean, so now I have volunteers that are going, yeah, I want to do that. We always wondered why Meals on Wheels doesn't do something on the weekend. Any, what are the people, are they fasting those two days? <laughs> so, so we just, now we have volunteers involved going out and pr all privately funded, 
preparing a meal, taking it out to people who are elderly and, and in need. And so we've got to watch for opportunities like that. Had another state cut to prison reentry program. Everybody was up in arms because what are we going to do? These guys coming out of prison need work boots. We don't know what we're going to do. And they talked with our local legislators and they talked with me and I said, I'm the wrong guy to be talking with. I say, cut it. And uh, why? Well, because I think someone's going to pick it up if they cut it. And guess what happened? A local church picked it up, and now instead of the prisoners going to a state-funded place to get their boots, they're going to a church where they're helping them get boots to go back to work. So again, we've got to watch for opportunities whenever there are cuts being made to see if we can rally up volunteers and then make sure we're capturing those stories to share them. And you won't know whether that's possible to do until you're actually forced to do it. This is true. So, uh, other questions, comments? Susan? Can you just describe, um, first of all, the charity tracker and privacy concerns? How does that work? And then also what Watered Gardens does specifically? Okay. Charity Tracker is a, a, a tool of our True Charity Initiative. It's created by a group called Simon Solutions out of northern Alabama, uh, and, it, and it tracks all of this information that swirls around in a benevolent community. It came out of Hurricane Katrina. That was the demand that rose at Hurricane Katrina and the mess of resource distribution and not knowing who was getting what and why and if they were really in need. And so they developed this software tool. Uh, I planted it in our city about 12 years ago. Um, it, it had, it's HIPAA compliant. Uh, so it, it, it's passed all of the jump through the hoops of privacy concern. And well, of course, we do training for every person that comes on board to Charity Tracker uh, for our community because you don't want someone who's not thinking about making professional entries and, you know, that kind of thing and how to use, make sure that that data is being used properly and that type of thing. So there's training that goes into play and they are HIPAA compliant. It tracks all of the benevolence that's being distributed to people. But not only that, note to an end of... Right, to an individual or a family. So where an individual or a family might go to one place for something and then to another place for something and to another place for something, all of those places are able to see that happening real time. And, uh, and so that's, 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 uh, that's the way that that works. But, but we also are able to, when we put in goals for an individual... Uh, those goals are then read by other organizations. So it allows us as a community to operate more as a unit in a collaborative fashion for the true help of that individual or that family in need. It's sharing information. And in this 21st century uh, time, we need to be doing that. I personally think that it was one of the reasons why we may have abdicated some of this to a centralized form of, of care, the state, uh, you know, a hundred plus years ago, was because there was such a, a, an inability to coordinate activity very well. And, and the government's good at centralizing. So that, that, I think, was part of the reason why we did that. We can now see that pendulum swing in the other direction. We are an Uberized society, so we can figure out some different ways to do it now. Watered Gardens does four primary things other than the True Charity Initiative. We have our outreach center where we're meeting very basic needs. Our outreach center is uh, where we're engaging people who are homeless on the streets, their addicts, and we're, you know, or, or you know, people coming out of prison or they're getting off the bus, they don't have anywhere to go, and we're engaging them right there. And so that we'll, we'll meet more than 20,000 basic needs through our food pantry and our furniture appliance bank. And it's all of the basics at, at our outreach center. And we have an emergency shelter there for men and for women. And so that's, that's that. Uh, our worth shop is the other thing that we do. And again, people coming in the doors immediately are beginning to earn things they need by crafting really cool c copper bracelets out of, re you know, they recycle copper and stamp whatever you want into them. And then we, uh, so we have a little market for that. And uh, that's, that's our worth shop. Um, Neighbor Connect, which I've already described to you, is another thing that uh, we're, we're very busy in doing and just coordinating needs in our community in that, in that regard. And uh, so the Outreach Center and our Worth Shop and, and Neighbor Connect. And there's one other thing that I'm, I'm missing that'll come to me, Susan, in a minute, and I'll share it with you. But Tell us about, uh, about Dave. Uh, you have various stories about people who... Um, 
could be helped, but they've gone in a whole different uh, different direction. Um, do you remember that, that story in particular? or? Yeah, I, I think so. And I want to go back as Forge. I just remembered. So our long-term program for men is the other thing that we do. So we have a year-long program for guys that uh, is work-ready uh, and character Building character and getting back to work. So that's the other thing that we that we've got going on. But you wanted you wanted Dave to work for his food, and he was resentful. Yeah, about that. Yeah, Dave. Well, it was actually because of the work of Charity Tracker and bringing our community together. And Dave uh, was not able to receive food from someplace because he had been to too many places. And we had all made a decision as a community that we're probably not really helping him. So they sent him down to my office and said, well, go talk to that guy because he was upset. <laughs> so he ends up in my office and he's mad about it. And uh, I said, and I looked at I looked at his record on our community. I was like, gosh, Dave, there's so much stuff that's been given to you and it's just not really really helping you, let's think about something else to do. I said, I tell you what, if you're needing food today, why don't you help at the mission for a little bit and I'll give you some food. And, and, and he said as, as just, I mean, as sincerely as could be, he said, why should I have to work for my food? And, uh, and I, I'll never forget that because it was, he was so sincere about it, but he actually felt like food is a right uh, and, and I think some people would say housing is a right. And so we have a mix-up going on about what are rights and what, what are not rights. But uh, Dave felt like food was a right. I remember seeing Dave after I came back from Haiti. And Haiti was an interesting place when I was there uh, after the, after the uh, earthquake. And just seeing a lot of small little enterprises and people were really, you know, working hard to sell this or sell that. And... and uh, and when I got back, one of the first people I saw at the mission was Dave's in my foyer of the mission. And he was on his phone, and he, looks, he, he was so unhappy. And I thought, I met people who are so much more poverty in Haiti, but being industrious and entrepreneurial in nature and seem more joy-filled than a guy who really has everything. In fact, at that point, uh, when, when, I, when I saw Dave, that day, he actually had government-subsidized housing as well and was not happy at all. Uh, you touched on the idea that people are like multifaceted beings. So we don't need just like a job or just a house or something physical. Like we also need like spiritual support and like emotional support and like purpose in life and things like that. Um, so I was reading the statistic recently that said that within the homeless population, um, that has the highest density of people um, with schizophrenia. And so I was wondering, what do you do in situations um, where people maybe have like mental or physical disabilities or like illnesses and things like that? How do you help um, bring like the multifaceted um, things that they need for people that are struggling with things like that? Yeah, great question. And um, I think it would make sense to anybody that people who are really struggling on some of those serious serious issues like that are going to end up maybe, you know, uh, in deep poverty or homeless. And I'm thinking of a lady named uh, Mary Kathleen, who was a lady who pushed a grocery cart around our city. Her story was really interesting. She uh, lived in central Florida. Her, her, uh, she lost one of her three children to meningitis. Her husband developed a, a, frontal form of, a frontal lobe form of epilepsy, and their marriage dissolved. She began to cycle out would be diagnosed with schizophrenia, wandered our streets for three years, never lying down. She would always sleep sitting up because she was too fearful to lie down. Had told us if we ever had a women's shelter, she'd come into our shelter, but she wouldn't go anywhere else. She really was off the grid. She was truly off the grid. And uh, we ended up opening a women's emergency shelter and she came in. During that six plus months that she was with us, um, she would come into my office and she would bissel the office and work in, in, in there. And I would, you know, talk with her and get to know her. Uh, and so I, the reason I share that story with you is because there are some people that we look at that we go, pretty hopeless. I mean, we better just like give them whatever it is that they're needing. And what I found is that there's almost always some way to reawaken dignity and worth in a person's life 
almost all the time. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we don't run into some very serious situations that require like professional psychiatric care and things like that. So our team's pretty good at discerning, okay, I'm going to need to get a hold of, uh, you know, Dr. So-and-so down at the hospital and see if we can make a connection there. So it's, uh, uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a balance and an artful walk. But, but the main thing is, is we should never look at anybody and go, oh my gosh, they're a case, not going to be able to really do much in that situation. Good question, though. So we go back 15 or 20 years, and at that time, compassion seemed to be on the, on the national agenda. Compassion and conservatism is being talked about. We seem to have moved pretty far away from that right now. We don't really hear a lot about compassion coming out of Washington or any discussion of what it really means or discussion of what dignity means. So in your view, when you compare now to nationwide, to as you, when you started with water gardens, uh, when you compare that to where we are now, not just in Joplin, but do you see some, do you see some hope for your ideas to catch on elsewhere, or are we, are we heading in the opposite direction at this point, and what possibly can turn us around? Yeah, well, I, 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 do, I, do, I, am, a hope, I am hopeful. I'm very hopeful. I think that uh, there is an awakening to um, uh, real compassion, I think a liberty, and to me, liberty and charity go, go hand in hand. And so I, I think there are more and more people that are, that are interested in these things. Um, I, I'm hopeful that it won't be a collapse that puts us in the position where I would like for us to go prior to. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my hope is that wise minds will prevail and will understand that we're on an unsustainable track and that uh, there's more good that could be done at the local level if we're just educated and equipped with some things to do a good job, and that, uh, and that the state should be tertiary to what's being done in a community. Um, and, and so I, I think that uh, <laughs> it's a calculable thing. At some point, we're not able to continue to do what we've been doing uh, you know, as a growing welfare system and state. So as you calculate, which do you think is more likely? That there will be a turning around wisely <laughs> or that there'll be a collapse and then we're forced to it? I'm an optimist, but uh, I think the reasonable person in me uh, fears that it'll be a collapse. Yeah. Okay, on that happy note, <laughs> uh, let's, let's conclude for now. Please join me in thanking James for coming here through snow, and we, we pray that you'll be successful and we won't all have this, we won't see this collapse. Yes. So, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Olasky. Yeah.